I welcome you and um, obviously <coughs> while this seminar is devoted to solutions to the world urg urgent problems, uh, naturally the traumatic events require that I address them very briefly. Um, and I want to just say, while I'm touching upon these different existential threats to our civilization, uh, the solutions are within reach and entirely depend on our action. So this is not an academic seminar, but really a call you know, to move to implement what we will present over the course of the afternoon. Now, <coughs> I think one can say that we have an existential civilizational crisis. If you look at all the different crisis spots and different subjects, refugee crisis, financial <coughs> crisis, war danger, uh, cultural crisis, at least in the transatlantic world, one can actually say that the human species <coughs> is being tested. Are we morally fit to survive? Are we intellectually able to grasp and seize the solutions which exist? Or are we doomed to continue on the present course which is heading towards disaster? Now, obviously, <coughs> uh, it is important to correct some of the readings how developments are being presented in the public domain. And let me just touch on very briefly what happened in Brussels yesterday, which obviously concerns everybody, the threat of terrorism, uh, which is now being portrayed by <coughs> the official governments that we have to give up data security, that we have to have more uh, centralization, we have to give up freedoms. And I would counter that with the statement that when the attack on Charlie Hebdo happened more than a year ago in Paris, the former head of the 9-11 Commission of the US Senate, Senator Bob Cohen, said if the famous 28 pages concerning the role of Saudi Arabia in the original September 11th attack would have been published, this Charlie Hebdo terrorism would not have happened. Now, obviously, <coughs> Uh, you cannot discuss what happened in Brussels and the threat of terrorism without looking at the role of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, pushing Wahhabi Salafism, uh, and naturally the fact that Turkey is up to the present day buying oil from ISIS, uh, is supporting uh, <coughs> ISIS with weapons uh, and equipment, and you know, the spokesman of the Russian Foreign Ministry, Maria Sakharova, just said yesterday uh, that the double standard concerning terrorism has to stop, that you cannot support terrorism on one part of the globe and not expect it to appear at other parts of the globe. Now, just to give you one example, on the 15th of March, a couple of days ago, uh, the Saudi-led coalition bombed a marketplace in Mataba, in the north of Yemen, which uh, caused 120 people to be killed, among them 20 children and 80 wounded. Uh, and this was not mentioned at all in the Western media. So these people were as much human beings as you know, the people in Brussels. Now also, in light of what I just said, the fact that the EU is betting all their eggs on the deal with Turkey to solve the refugee crisis is completely ludicrous. The RD, even the uh, former neocon ambassadors of the United States to Turkey, Eric Edelman and Morton uh, Abramovich, who both were ambassadors in Turkey, uh, said that the Erdogan government uh, does not function, that it's an authoritarian regime economically collapsing and conducting civil war against their own population, namely the Kurds. So therefore, you know, if the EU says we have to solve the refugee crisis with a deal with that government, when the UN High Commissioner already said that the mass deportation of refugees now going on from Greece to Turkey is illegal and uh, <coughs> that uh, also it does not function because the day one after this agreement went into effect, uh, <coughs> 1,662 refugees uh, landed in Greece, 
uh, seeking new routes, new islands, um, and especially the Jesuitic population uh, refugees is very afraid uh, to be sent back into the arms of ISIS. Now, the UN Organization of, of the Human Rights and the Doctors Without Borders, in protest, have stopped their work working with the refugees because they say this is untenable, this does not work. Uh, <clears throat> so the UN Human Rights Commission also said uh, that the so-called hotspots, which are supposed to solve the refugee crisis according to the EU, have been turned into detention camps, families are not allowed uh, to leave their home, uh, and they have de facto been turned into prisons. Now, the United Left of Spain is pursuing a criminal suit against uh, pra Minister, Minister President Rajoy uh, because of condoning the EU-Turkey agreement, saying this is an omission of help, uh, <clears throat> this is a deportation of human beings who have the right to be at least checked if they have the right to, to have asylum, and you cannot just deport them uh, like that. So other media, like in Hungary, which is being attacked by the EU, uh, they say what happened to the humanistic rights or values of the European Union. Now, our President Gauck is presently on a tour to China where he brings up human rights violations in China. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, this is, uh, would be a farce if it was not so tragic for the people who are uh, the victims of the EU policy. Now let's look at another, and let me just say this on China. Uh, China, in response to the accusations of human rights, issued their own report on human rights violations in the United States, uh, going into the continuous wars in the Middle East based on lies, the drone killings, uh, and you know, saying it is ridiculous that the United States is still playing the role of a judge in the human rights case in light of all of this. Now China in turn has uplifted 900 million people out of poverty. Now in my book they have done more for human rights than anybody who is accusing them of violating human rights because if you look at the EU and the United States in turn where the rate of poor people is increasing all the time. In the United States it's 50 million uh, and, and rising. And uh, one element of the new five-year plan of China is to allevi alleviate poverty in China until the year 2020 and uh, uh, worldwide, I think, until 2025. So, <coughs> um, therefore, uh, you know, there is, one needs to have a different view than that which is being presented by the media. Now let's look at a second spin and big lie. There is the big story that China would be responsible for the financial turmoil in the markets, uh, that the Chinese economy would be collapsing, that the new Silk Road would be a flop. Now look at what is the situation in Europe. Uh, the EZB chief, uh, Mario Draghi, uh, not only put the interest rate on zero, interest rate, negative interest rate for banks who want to park uh, money in the banks, but he is now openly talking about helicopter money. Uh, you know, helicopter money means just to throw money out of helicopters to flood the markets with liquidity. And even Ottmar Issing, who is a staunch monetarist to my knowledge, the former chief economist of the EZB said, uh, this is a devastating idea. A central bank, which is giving out money for free, uh, is hardly able to ever regain control of the markets. This is total mental disarray. Now, fortunately, the lifeboat for the sinking Titanic of the European and US economy is already there in the form of the new Silk Road offer of China, the One Belt, One Road policy. Now this was proposed by Xi Jinping two years ago uh, in uh, <coughs> uh, Kazakhstan and since then has taken a traumatic development. There are now over 70 nations which have uh, expressed concrete interest to cooperate with the Silk Road and over 30 countries have 
uh, have signed very concrete uh, agreements on many, many projects. This new Silk Road, which the Schiller Institute has been campaigning for for 25 years, it was our answer to the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, is a completely different model. Uh, it's based on what President Xi Jinping calls a win-win policy, that countries cooperate on joint pro projects uh, on the basis of mutual interest, of complete respect for the sovereignty of the other nation, and naturally China is pursuing its own interest, but it is also providing what is in the interest of the participating countries. Now, <coughs> um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi just recently said, this new Silk Road is China's idea, but it creates opportunities for the whole world. And it is definitely uh, the, <coughs> uh, you know, new model of relations among all countries. Now, presently, the Chinese inner Asian trade is progressing with high growth rates. However, the relations with Europe and the United States is suffering, not because of China, but because of the economic and financial turmoils in the EU and in the United States. But the Chinese leadership response uh, to that uh, is to turn a crisis into an opportunity by pushing the internal Chinese economy into the next qualitative leap, uh, by innovating uh, new and creating new interest, uh, industries, upgrading the technological level of the labor force. And at the just concluded uh, Congress of the National People Congress, where they presented the 13th five-year plan, Prime Minister Li Keqiang used the word innovation 61 times in his speech. He said the aim is to turn China from a trader of quantity to a trader of quality, uh, <coughs> to uh, basically make it a knowledge intensive economy. And if you look, for example, one of the export uh, <coughs> flagships of the Chinese is the high speed uh, rails. Uh, where China has built 125 kilometers of normal train railroad, but about 20,000 kilometers of fast train. They want to have 50,000 kilometers by the year 2025, uh, connecting every major city in China with a fast train system. And I can tell you, I was traveling with um, fast trains in various uh, ways in China, uh, these trains go about 310 kilometers. They go very smooth. They don't shake. You don't hear anything. It's an excellent technology, and it's one of the export uh, <coughs> uh, really uh, flagships of China. So this concept uh, of building the one belt, ro one road, uh, which in Asia also <coughs> is uh, being called the Asian <coughs> connectivity, is very, very uh, attractive. Uh, <coughs> it uh, <coughs> uh, basically means you know, that it's very high technology. Uh, Wu Yi, uh, who is the director of Chinese uh, Science Center, uh, just uh, said, you know, space science is inseparable from China's innovation-driven development. If China wants to be a strong global nation, uh, it must not only care about its own immediate interest, but must also contribute to humankind. Only in this way, China can uh, <coughs> have real respect uh, in the world. Now, how advanced the Chinese space program is, for example, you can see by the fact that next year, the next lunar mission of China will go to the far side of the moon. Uh, which means that <coughs> uh, lenders and orbiters will land there, which has never been done by mankind, and the far side of the moon will give a new window uh, into uh, space because free from the noise from the Earth and radiation, you can develop much, much better understandings about what is going in the, uh, in the far, uh, in the universe uh, close by uh, uh, in, a, in a very concrete way. 
Now, <coughs> China is doing everything right. I'm not saying everything, but many, many things right, by simply doing what Germany used to do when Germany was progressing. Shang Fulin, the chairman of the China Banking Regulatory Commission, uh, at this recent uh, <coughs> occasion just said, China will from now on tax uh, monetary uh, speculative uh, transaction with a, what you would call here a Tobin tax. They will promote uh, small and middle level industries uh, they will uh, further the savings banks to give credit to these small industries, which is what the German Mittelstand uh, used to be and what made Germany prosperous. And <coughs> basically, uh, Li Keqiang also said it is the top priority of the financial sector to support the development of the real economy as compared, and that is now my words, uh, the printing money of Mario Draghi for speculative purposes uh, alone. Now, I just uh, two weeks ago or 10 days ago returned from a big conference in New Delhi, the Raisina Dialogue, which is now going to be an annual conference organized by the Indian government. Uh, and uh, there I can assure you that many speakers from Asian countries acting foreign ministers, former presidents, uh, leaders of leading institutions, they all want to integrate with the one belt, one road policy because they have recognized what the new Silk Road means for countries like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, <coughs> Afghanistan, a means that they can import the Chinese economic development model and repeat what China did in terms of the very rapid economic development they have undergone in the last 40 years, but especially in the last 25 years. Now, the Schiller Institute proposed uh, already some years ago, uh, namely in 2012, that the only way how you stop terrorism and how you stop now in the last year the refugee crisis is by bringing development to Southwest Asia, to Africa, uh, because only if you have a comprehensive development program for those countries which have been destroyed by wars uh, or a lack of development like in the case of Africa, only if you apply the method of the new Silk Road to the Middle East, to Africa, that you can solve these problems. And this is now uh, on the table uh, I think with the visit of President uh, Xi Jinping to Tehran uh, four or five weeks ago where he presented the new Silk Road and shortly after his visit the first Silk Road train arrived uh, from Yiwu uh, in China in Tehran with I think 32 containers uh, and Xi Jinping said uh, that the new Silk Road is a concept to be expanded in the entire Southwest Asian region. Immediately, President Rouhani from, uh, <coughs> from Iran uh, said that Iran wants to cooperate. Uh, at this conference in New Delhi, where I was, former President Karzai said Afghanistan must become the hub of the new Silk Road connecting Asia and Europe. And other leading speakers uh, spoke uh, to uh, the same effect. Now, <coughs> I want to say, and you will hear about this from, from other speakers, I suppose, that the only way how we will get out of this crisis is that we develop the Middle East together with Russia, China, India, Iran, Egypt, and other countries of the region, and that we get Germany, France, Italy, the United States, and all other countries to cooperate in what I would call a Marshall Plan Silk Road perspective for the Middle East and, and Africa. Sil I only mention Marshall Plan not because it's meant to be a Cold War uh, instrument like the Marshall Plan was, but because it reminds people in Europe that you can reconstruct countries which have been destroyed by war with economic development. And that is the only way how we stop the refugee crisis because only if you give an incentive for the people to rebuild their own home countries and you give young people a perspective of hope to become a doctor, a scientist, a teacher, 
that you can dry out terrorism. And that is the concrete plan which is now on the table. And either we can get uh, European institutions to go for this alternative or we will crash against the wall. So that is what I want to say initially.